Without further ado, let's get down to business tonight. Welcome to the uh, last part, fourth lecture in the series called Pearl Harbor, Hiroshima, the Jews. Remark a remarkable yet unknown uh, chapter in American history. American history. Tonight is the fourth lecture, which is entitled, But They Won't Surrender, Hiroshima, End of the War in the American Occupation of Japan. The Jewish Angle, as you can see, tonight's uh, talk is being sponsored by uh, Tuesday night um, CLC Sharm, because we have all kinds of Sharm here in the show. Um, and that's Ari and Avron. Uh, Elbaum, obviously, in loving memory of the relative Kunabas Ruvain, and by Brad, Brad Kaufman, and in loving memory of his father, Philip, and uh, grandmother, Rosalie, and Rachel Idabas Baruch Shlomo. So uh, uh, all Nisham should have an Aliyah, as the expression goes. Now, um, j I just wanted to uh, show you, I'm going away for a few days, but uh, Sunday night, I said over and over again, there's the title. Uh, the Jewish doctor, the fat king, and the 10th century diet that made history from the age of uh, Spanish uh, history. Okay? Um, again, it's the Jewish doctor and the fat king, not the Jewish king and the fat doctor. <laughs> okay? Um, that would be a bad advertisement. So that's on a Sunday night. Around 5 o'clock, I may go first. I may not go first, but, you know, that'll be one of them. Secondly, that's the Jerry Insel thing. Secondly, I'm hoping, Mitzvah Shem, as I do, by tradition now, uh, when it comes to three weeks, and that's when this is, in late July, comes three before Tishvah, I want to do uh, the Inquisition after 1492. You know, we talked about Spain years ago, which is a whole parsha, as, as I will try to argue. Right now, I'm uh, trying to find the sponsors for all this. If anybody wants to step forward and volunteer, I, I promise not to turn you down. Um, to... Um, 45, 1945. But it didn't turn out exactly the way people thought it was. The way it's supposed to be is as the war gets more and more along the way, and the enemy's supposed to get weaker and weaker and fall apart. America faced a dilemma in early 1945. On, uh, on the one hand, um, Franklin Roosevelt was determined, already at the beginning of the war, and this is part of his godless, to uh, articulate a clear goal of unconditional surrender. I'll repeat, unconditional surrender. Contrary to what you might hear, that's usually not what happens in a war. 99% of the wars is, uh, I want a piece of territory, I want you to leave me alone, I want satisfaction, I want an indemnity, something like that. Uh, unconditional surrender means you can come and take over everything. You know, there's nothing that I don't, you, you, Russia can occupy America, you know what I mean? Like, they take everything. So that was a pretty strong um, statement, and... Uh, it's uh, famous that Roosevelt, already at the Casablanca Conference, early in, relatively early in the war, when the American army was in North Africa, and uh, he was always very conscious of every word he said, especially during the war. Very interesting uh, communicator, as I mentioned before. You can like, he had pluses and minuses. We all know about that, especially Jews know he had pluses and minuses. But he had pluses. And uh, his ability to uh, hammer home clear messages in simple but uh, strong language is a key element of who he was. Here's an example uh, of what... For ten epoch-making days, Casablanca became the solar plexus of Anglo-American leadership. The Anfa Hotel was the meeting place when Premier Churchill and President Roosevelt, accompanied by the chiefs of staff of the two countries, laid plans for this year's offensive. The combined staffs were in almost constant session. Admiral of the Fleet Sir Dudley Pound, General Sir Alan Brooke, and Air Chief Marshal Sir Charles Portal for Britain, Admiral King, General Marshal, and General Arnold for the USA, Sir John Dill, General Somerville, Lord Louis Mountbatten, these and many others formed the imposing assembly which gathered in Casablanca. Mr. Churchill arrives at the press conference held in the grounds overlooking the Atlantic. The North African Conference is the fourth occasion on which the two great men have met since the beginning of the war a marshalling of effort for the more intense prosecution of the conflict. At this informal meeting with the press, a new phrase was born, unconditional surrender for the Axis. So in other words, you know, he just tossed it out of the press conference and then became a key fixture of American policy, and he said it over and over again. He said, I want to be very clear about this. Now, uh, Roosevelt, of course, got this from General Grant. Many people will remember from the Civil War, U.S. Grant, Ulysses S. Grant, it stands for Unconditional Surrender, where uh, 
in uh, Fort Donaldson, I think, in 1862. He says, no, no uh, terms except unconditional surrender can be accepted. But, uh, and, this, and the Confederates uh, surrendered, of course. But it's a little bit out of place, because it's talking about a fort. He's talking about a country. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? And second of all, you know, in the Civil War, they weren't that brutal. If you surrender, you were a prisoner. They actually used to parole you. Uh, here, you're talking, you're talking about Hitler, you're talking about Japan, you're talking about Russia. It's, 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 it's gigantic. But Roosevelt chose to uh, push it, and he did it deliberately, in spite of the fact that there was a lot of criticism around the world on the part of the Allies of this uh, declaration, because he says it's just going to make it's going to help Hitler and, and Goebbels. The uh, let's go to the next one. Uh, the Germans pounded in their propaganda history. Uh, uh, Roosevelt wants to destroy Germany, wants to kill everybody, uh, and that made all the Germans fight harder. At least that was the argument. You understand? And to make the Japanese fight harder. So why are you doing that? You know, if it was to Stalin, he'd say like this. Promise him you won't do anything, and then kill him. You understand? You know, that, that's how they do business. That's how they do business over there. Uh, why? Why should you go and 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 give him a uh, a, a uh, excuse or, or a weapon, so to speak, a propaganda weapon? But the reason is clear. Roosevelt had been in the First World War. He'd been an assistant secretary in the Navy. He's part of that whole generation. Remember, he came into office, or he came into the war presidency, more experienced than anybody else in American history in in running a war. I'll say it again, he was number two, and a very big number two in the Navy during World War I, when the country had to organize itself to fight that uh, particular conflict. So he knew the ins and outs of this kind of business. And uh, he also knew that one of the things Hitler used very effectively was the German myth um, that Hitler created and which created Hitler, and that was a stab in the back. Here's a famous, uh, look, the Jews are stabbing Germany in the back. And what it, it's a lie, obviously, but it's more than what you think. It's not just an anti-Semitic lie. I'll explain very quickly. The Germans lost the First World War. But on the other hand, if you know the military situation, the German army was in France at the end of the First World War. The Allies never got into Germany. It's just that they saw the jig is up, so they called an armistice. And then the Allies, right or wrong, said... We're blockading you, not giving you any food unless you totally agree to our surrender terms, which the Germans are very angry about. But had they not surrendered at that time or agreed to the armistice, the Allies were preparing to have a gigantic offensive in 1919 because the war ended in November 1918. And then they were going to bust into Germany like they did in the Second World War and destroy the place. So you might say that the Germans in the First World War did a very smart thing. They got out... Uh, just before the end of the movie, you know what I mean? You know, they got just, just at the last moment so that they wouldn't actually be occupied and hurt by the other side. But if you're the German generals, you wouldn't admit that you were actually defeated or you led the country to defeat. And that by the end of the First World War, I'm talking about the Kaiser's time, that the Kaiser was an idiot, the general screwed up, the army was betrayed, the, uh, you know, the, the, the officers didn't do the right thing, and they conducted the war in such a way that they mamish lost. No, one never says that. So we didn't lose. We actually were going to win. But riots broke out in Germany. That's true. And communist revolution broke out in Germany in November 1918. That's true. And that's the reason, that's a lie, that's the reason that we gave in. And we all know who the communists are, it's the Jews. And therefore, Ludendorff, when he wrote his memoirs, and many other generals, never would admit we lost, what they said was like this, we were winning, but we were stabbed in the back. Here's the, right? And this became the Dolchstoss in German. And that became like a key element of what led Hitler to power, the Nazis. And I can tell you right now, a Hitler uh, believed it, right? Because sometimes you believe your own life. Hitler believed it. And in the Second World War, uh, he ran Germany so tightly with the Gestapo and all the SS and all that stuff that it was clear down till Hitler, the day he killed himself, is not gonna, he said a hundred times, there's not going to be no stab in the back this time. So even when the Allies actually broke into Germany, the Americans on the, over the Rhine and the Russians over here, and even when they were in Hitler's block, as you know, because he shot himself just when the reported Russians came in to the Reichstag, uh, the German people did not rise up against him because they were all being spied on by the Gestapo and the SS and all this other stuff. And nobody wanted to be accused of making a, a stab in the back. So on the other hand, Roosevelt said like this, this time we're going to beat Germany uh, fair square, and we're not going to let any kind of 
excuse pop up so that in the future generation, another 20 years later, some other German leader will say like this, we really would have won World War II, but we were stabbed in the back. This time, we're going to make it clear. We're going all the way until you completely and totally surrender and put down all your arms and let us come in and take everything you want, every, whatever we want. We're not barbarians like you are, right? The America's not going to go in and kill all the civilians the way you would have done, but we can. <laughs> in other words, but we want it unconditional. Now, I'll say it again. There's almost no country in history that agrees to unconditional surrender. I can think of very few. Um, not even one comes to mind at the moment. It's not what you think. Usually, when there's, you know, one side says, like, it's okay, we're losing, let's make peace, what, what do you want? Let's negotiate like the Russians and the Japanese, like they did in Napoleon's time, like they did all throughout history. You know, if, if you're stronger, stronger, I have to give you more. If you're not quite so strong, I have to give you less. But what is it that, you know, uh, ends up in, in a complete unconditional surrender? Um, as I said before, Roosevelt did this for moral clarity. And this was uh, his strong suit. He said, we're in the war, people getting killed, the GIs, the sailors, all the rest of it. I want it clear what they're dying for, and what they're dying for is to make sure that this will not happen again. Here's an, a, a classic speech he gives. I love this because he sits in a short sleeve shirt. I like anybody that has a short sleeve white shirt. Um, especially, especially when Hitler goes around in the uniform and Mussolini goes around the uniform, you know, everybody wants in a uniform, and he was like, trying to show I'm a civilian. Yes, that was, that, that's part of his uh, shtick. And so take a look at this uh, speech he gives early in, in uh, yeah, that's it, in uh, 1943. first crack in the axis has come. The criminal, corrupt, fascist regime in Italy is going to pieces. Mussolini came to the reluctant conclusion that the jig was up. He could see the shadow of the long arm of justice. But he and his fascist gang will be brought to book and punished for their crimes against humanity. No criminal will be allowed to escape by the expedience of resignation. Our terms to Italy are still the same as our terms to Germany and Japan. Unconditional surrender. Ahead of us are much bigger fights. We and our allies will go into them as we went into Sicily, together. And we shall carry on, together. In the Pacific, we are pushing the Japs around, from the Aleutians to New Guinea. There, too, we have taken the initiative, and we are not going to let go of it. It becomes clearer and clearer that the attrition, the whittling down process against the Japanese is working. The Japs have lost more planes and more ships than they've been able to replace. We shall not settle for less than total victory. So again, he used the same language. He said, you know what, we, 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 we're going all the way, none of this half and half business. We went to complete and total surrender of them. And that, that's, you know, ten times. I could give you ten, ten speeches like that. Now, um, the only things like this doesn't make sense in light of what we're doing, what I'm trying to do in this uh, series here. Uh, Germany made total sense. You can't let a le little bit of Hitler <laughs> survive. It's like a cancer, correct? Suppose they would leave Hitler just with a, with a city block. You would build up after that. Japan is a different story. I mean, you know, this was it really necessary? I'm, I'm just raising the question. Was it necessary to say the Japanese have to be totally, you know, conquered or like, like they later came in and, 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 and take over everything? Not so push it. Um, in the case of Germany, as we know, the entire country was physically conquered by 1945. That is what happened. Hitler, not only was no unconditional surrender, Hitler uh, fought to the last the minute and then shot himself, as we all know. The brunt of the fighting, to be perfectly honest, and of the dying was done by the Russians, by the Red Army. Okay? You, I think everybody knows that. As a matter of fact, it's a double you do it. The Americans could have gone into Berlin. And Eisenhower said like this, let the Russians do it. In other words, they want to. And why should I, why should any soldier get killed for something they want to do anyway? Why should Americans get killed for that? You know and I don't blame them after what the Germans did to them. I don't blame them a bit for what they're doing to the Germans. And Eisenhower was very popular for saying that. So what I'm tr trying to say is, in the case of Germany, it was Mamshan conditional surrender, or more than that, the government dissolved. 
You understand? By the time the war was over in Germany, there was no German government. You hear what I said? The, the, the German government ceased. The Allies took over every square inch and it divided up between the Americans, the British, the Russians, the French. There was no government in Germany. A few years later, they made a gov- the Allies allowed a government to form. Um, that's unusual. Okay? That's unusual. Now, um, so there, Taka was unconditional surrender. In the case of Japan, on the other hand, as I've been trying to say here, the home islands, the Japan Mamish, were not physically conquered, ever. Uh, the Americans had terrible casualties as 1945 progressed on Iwo Jima and Okinawa. I, I told you that. The, the, the Japanese did this on purpose. The closer you get, the more you'll lose. Ha ha. The Japanese government had no intention of giving in. The Japs were planning to leverage their ability to inflict enormous casualties in order to get better peace terms. And it makes sense. Agree? Makes sense. You really want to do like unconditional threat, all that stuff, I mean, you, 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 okay, get ready to lose a million men. Because the Japanese can do what Churchill said. We will fight them on the beaches, we will fight them on the landing strips, we will never surrender. It sounded good when Churchill said it. How come it didn't sound good when the Japanese said it? You see? To them, that's the, they're their own Churchills. And so the American leadership was very nervous, plenty nervous, because who wants hundreds of thousands dead? This ain't Russia. You know, we had 30 million killed and they went weiter. I told you yesterday, and I think you know it anyway, this country can't take heavy cash. That's just not who America is. So the only way around that that Roosevelt and General Marshall could think of was uh, Stalin. Okay? And that's why at the Tehran Conference in November of 43 and at the Yalta Conference in February of 45, one of the things they were pressing to Stalin was like this is, will you come help us with Japan? Will you come and help us with Japan? Uh, because we need, and what they, um, I'll tell you what they had in mind. You have two, three million Japanese soldiers in China, Manchuria, all the rest of it. Let the Russians fight them. You understand? Let the Russians fight them. I, Stalin, will take Manchuria, all the rest of it. I'll tell you what Roosevelt said. Let him take Manchuria. I'd rather do that than lose a million Americans. You understand? So the guy wasn't stupid. You understand? He, he knew that he's making a big concession. Right? And maybe Stalin will take this and that and the other. But it's a cheshman. He said, I don't, I, don't, I don't want all the casualties. Um, <coughs> Stalin comes with a price. They knew it. Stalin already said at Tehran, secretly, that uh, you know, Russia wants all the territory they lost to Japan in the Russian-Japanese War. Don't blame them. He's a Russian. You know, I, I can understand that. Doing the Kuril Island, the Sakhalin, and this, Port Arthur, and all that kind of junk. Um, Roosevelt was willing to pay. So General Marshall, as I said before. You know? The one guy who was not willing, or felt very bitter about, was a Forrestal, the Secretary of the Navy. Because Forrestal was already thinking ahead. It's like this. Today, Germany's the problem, and Japan, tomorrow, Russia's the problem. What's the point of you know, getting one enemy and building up another enemy, which is even stronger? So he, he was that type of person, uh, James Forrestal. And uh, therefore, he was scratching his head in early 1945, because he was a big thinker, if you know he was. Uh, Forrestal was the, the son of a, a bartender, who, uh, an Irish bartender, who worked himself up through education to, uh, get, you know, to get a job on Wall Street. You know, he, like, like you say, uh, pulled himself up by the bootstraps and so forth. Came a big mocker in Dylan Reed, you know, one of those big firms. And then went into the government, you know, where, where became the Undersecretary of the Navy. So he was a real strong American nationalist. It is precisely for this reason later on that he strongly opposed the rise of the State of Israel. Because a very strong American nationalist said, what do we want to antagonize the Arabs for? Now just saw Russia. Yes, I mean, no, you can you can understand his point of view, okay? And uh, so Forrestal was saying like this: How do we get Japan to surrender uh, without sustaining heavy casualties before the Russians come in, okay? How do you pers- ultimately what that means is like this? And here's the key element that I want to get across: Victory is about persuasion. We don't think that way, unless I just kill you all, okay? So it's like in the cowboy movies, and by fighting ten bad guys, and by the end of the movie you shoot all ten guys, okay, that works. But with well, a country, you can't do that. And so you kill this one, you kill this one, you bomb this one, you do this one, there's still others left, and they want to keep the fight going. So you have, victory means I have to persuade the other person that's in their interest to give up. We usually don't think this way, unless you run up against this. You get what I'm saying? 
If, if I'm telling the other side, if, when you surrender, I'm going to kill you, it's obviously why well, I'm just inviting that the other side should go on. We have this problem today in the modern world um, everywhere. Nobody surrenders anymore ever since uh, the, the end of World War II. Not that I can think of. Think of the conflicts. Nobody gives up. It's interesting. Uh, they go guerrilla fighting, uh, Iraq, uh, and, uh, Syria, Vietnam, um, India and China, uh, which got the Arab-Israeli conflict, uh, the African conflict. You understand? No, they just don't give in. That's all. And what inevitably happens is the stronger side has to get very brutal. That just invites counter brutality. And you know what? It festers. And what we see in our time, the time you and I are living in, is it often results in the breakdown of the state, what we call the failed state. And the only ones who gain from that are the bad guys, are the terrorists. The terrorists have come like a certain cancer on the uh, festering wounds of unresolved conflicts, which are all over the world. In Africa, I mean, you know, I don't even know all the names of the countries anymore. I'm too old for that stuff, right? You know, but there's, you know, this one's fighting this one, they never give in. That one's fighting her, and they never give in. It's, it, it, it's kind of remarkable, you understand? So, um, with that in mind, how do you persuade the Japanese to surrender? By this time, the Japanese were getting plastered. Uh, the Americans had perfected the General Curtis LeMay. They perfected the B-29 raids. Uh, what they realized was they don't know how to bomb with explosives, so use fire, make a fires. You understand? So it became arsonists. And, they put, and the Japanese city made out of wood. And so therefore, they started bombing all the Japanese cities with fire bombs, meaning not a bomb that blows up, but a bomb that starts a fire. Isn't that interesting? And the result was, overnight you have the Chicago fire, and millions of people get killed. I'll say it again, hundreds of thousands of Japanese get killed. It's a dover you do that more people were killed in one night of the regular bombs in, in Tokyo with the fire bombs than were killed by the atomic bomb. I'll say like I was started to say yesterday, people have a wrong idea about the atomic bomb. I'm not in favor of it, but it's not as lethal as you imagine, or maybe I should put it this way. The regular bombs can be quite lethal also. And anyway, that's what happened. Uh, here, take a look at this. Here you have the, the, the by the end of the war, uh, Roosevelt had created this gigantic bomber that never existed before, the B-29, which by that time was like a monster. And the Americans just went over all these cities and they, uh, as I said before, they just dropped fire stuff. And Tokyo, Yokohama, uh, you know, Osaka, all, all the big cities over there, I mean, all that is, is, is man-made fires. You understand? And uh, incidentally, that's a war against civilians. Uh, General LeMay and his assistant, whose name was Robert McNamara, uh, both said like this, if we lose the war, they're going to try us as war criminals, uh, which, is, which is true, you know? But the Americans, I mean, look at all that. The Americans were thinking like this, and it's very American. I want to raise the pressure so much that the war will be over, and then we'll stop all the killing. <laughs> like General Grant, you know? He said, we're killing everybody, then, but the minute it's over, it's totally over, and we switch to another way. So that's a very American Zah. Just make it unbearable. The problem is, there's no such thing as, um, they discovered to their horror, there's no such thing as unbearable for the Japanese. So what do you do then? And say, we're not used to thinking like this. If this, God forbid, ever happened in America, the country would, would surrender or something, you know? They couldn't take it. And over here, uh, they, they keep taking it. Uh, I'll tell you even farther, the Japanese government very cleverly channeled everybody's anger at the Americans. So in other words, they discovered, it's called the Strategic Bombing Survey, they discovered that heavy bombing doesn't really help, it just makes the civilians starker. It happened in Germany, happened in England, as you know, happened in Japan. They don't react the way you think they'll react. And so, the Japanese government was not affected by the destruction of cities. We don't understand their mentality. Here's the Prime Minister, uh, the last one, Suzuki, he was an old man, he was like a, uh, uh, 77 years old. Uh, he, was, he, was, he was an admiral in the Russian-Japanese War at Teddy Roosevelt time. And uh, he said like this, he said, you know, the Americans are obviously so weak, the best, the most they can do is make war against helpless civilians. Ha, ha, ha. Now, you'll say like this, what kind of a leader are you letting this happen to women and children? You're thinking in Western terms? I keep telling you over and over again, culture, culture, culture. It's a different mentality, you understand? And um, I'll go even farther. The emperor, Hirohito, was, a, if you know who he was, was pretty uh, uh, heartless and selfish. They're not bombing the palace, because that was an American policy. He's not getting hurt. Um, 
the regular people are getting here. They're not the aristocracy. Again, you and I don't live in a country with a tradition of aristocracy. But the European countries, the Asiatic countries, I mean, it's unbel- it, it, historians have studied this. To them, the only thing that counts is zich, themselves and the people around them, their tiny class. The rest of the public doesn't matter that much. You understand? We, we, we cannot fathom, most of us, because we don't have that kind of a culture we come out of. It doesn't matter that much. Uh, after the war, uh, for various reasons, Hirohito was, was uh, portrayed as a, you know, uh, a ceremonial guy. He didn't know what's happening and all that kind of stuff. And the Americans went along with MacArthur and more or less built that myth up. But it's a big lie. Uh, Hirohito was, uh, was in favor of starting the war in the first place. And all during the war, he said the soldiers should fight harder and die in this island to save the other ones. And what about the guys over here? Let them fight to the death. And, uh, you know, it's completely, uh, oops, it's completely heartless about all this kind of stuff. And it's kind of shocking for us to read it today, or at least to me, uh, because somebody writing about his own soldiers were in America, at least officially, and I think really, they cared about every soldier. I mean, it's necessary sometimes to send people into, into death. That's what war is. But you don't do it in such a way that's like, eh, big deal. But the Japanese had this tradition that the, the, most, the, the best thing in life is to die gloriously. I'm serious about that. I don't mean that as a rhetorical statement. Uh, it's a little bit like, it's not the same thing, it's a little bit like what you hear with the uh, crazy Muslim terrorists where they say, oh, they want to die and they, you know, they love death and things like that. You understand? It's, it's a different mentality. So he didn't care. So the point's like this. How are you going to persuade them? The top guys don't care, even if you wipe out all the cities. <laughs> because the Japanese were smart enough that the military stuff they put somewhere else and underground, and you know, they'll be ready when the Americans come. So you kill uh, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight million men, women, children. Eh, there's still, no, get it? There's still 60, 70 million left. Right? And even if you kill another five million. So, so here's Truman. And so, so, so what do we do? You know what I'm it's, it's not what you imagine. It's like, what do you do if you're, if you're a decision maker? Um, the Americans just don't understand the mentality of the Japanese ruling class, which is surprisingly callous to their own losses, including civilian losses. The Japanese view callousness as a natural virtue, like the old Romans. <laughs> okay? It's, 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 uh, you know, it's what it is. So it turns out that winning a war is not push it, as I tried to explain before. Uh, as you all know, Robert E. Lee got very good terms from General Grant. This is famous at Appomattox. Uh, one of the reasons is Grant was desperate. Yet to get the other side to agree that it's over, you're not going to have a, 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 what do you call it, a terrorist war in the mountains and a guerrilla war, but that the South will really agree, Gamarnu, you won, we lost. If you do that, Grant's, I guess you can keep your horses, I'll give you money, I'll do it, and, and, you know, that, 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 that's what we want. To secure peace after a war, and a genuine peace, is extremely difficult and requires a certain generosity and largeness of spirit on the part of the victor if you want the vanquished to admit that they're vanquished and act appropriately. <laughs> you see? So it's, a, it's, it's kind of interesting. Now, in addition to this, you have the following problem. You say, well, get rid of the people in charge. If you get rid of the people in charge, there's nobody to talk to. Let's say they bomb Hirohito and kill him. Is anybody going to be in charge? What, what, what if they blow up the, 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 the generals? Sounds like a good idea. Who's going to be in charge? If nobody's in charge, then how do you get surrender and peace? Didn't we make this problem in Iraq? They got rid of the, all the top guys, and then there's nobody in charge. Turns out that all the uh, terrorists and the different groups form out, and you get what they call the insurgency, and then it's impossible to get control of. As you know, the Americans were defeated by their victory. Okay? Because they knocked off the guys at the top, they had nobody to deal with, and then we have the situation where the Marines are fighting in Fallujah. In the middle of all this, Roosevelt died in April of 45. Truman got in. Truman, we have been, uh, and Truman didn't know anything, you know. I think many people are aware he never heard of the A-bomb and so forth. But besides that, uh, Truman was a, Truman was a, I mean, he said it himself. He said, you're putting me in a situation that I'm not ready for. He said those words. And, uh, you know, he was a senator from Missouri. You know, that's all he was. And uh, he didn't know much about what's going on. He certainly was no Roosevelt, and he certainly didn't know about the national uh, you know, uh, defense and the foreign policy. He didn't know it. And he said so. He had no hesitation in saying so. So here's Truman coming into office, and every day for 12 hours, they're giving him briefings. Yes, that's what it was. He was a hard worker. And so you know, he came with more books, 
you should do General Marshall and Admiral King and then this guy and that guy and then about the labor unions and all that. It's like overwhelming. And what can he do? He can only rely on the advisors. Um, he realized that soon Germany would be gone because um, Roosevelt died 10 days before Hitler. So uh, yeah, and ten, a few days after that, Germany surrendered or, or fell apart. Um, soon Germany would be gone and it becomes clear to Truman and his advisors, uh-oh, uh, Hitler will be gone, but here comes Stalin. <laughs> here comes Stalin. The two, um, what do you call it, uh, Forrestal was, was telling him all the time, he says, uh-oh, Stalin's going to communize Asia, like the way you're letting him communize uh, Europe, because how can we say we won the Second World War when half of, uh, you know, Poland and Hungary and Romania and all this country fell under, under, under the Russians, you see, w which is a threat to us. Realize, well, if enough for, well, I'll, I'll save that for later. Uh, then, uh, here comes our deus ex machina, ex machina. Just then, who, who approaches Forrestal was introduced to him on his way back from Iwo Jima? Uh, Ella Zacharias, <laughs> the, 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 the uh, Forrest Gump that we deal with over here, right? Uh, the officer, who was also a strong anti-communist, a Jewish naval officer, very strong in the Biden. His, his wife was not Jewish. He says, uh, and, and, and they were two peas in a pod. They thought the same way. They said, this is a terrible, the way America is fighting the war. You know, Stalin's going to come in, and it's bad enough what happened in Europe, and this is also going to happen in Asia. Um, but the thing is like this, the Captain Zacharias, because that's what he was, he'd been captain of a, of a small battleship. Uh, he, he said, I guess, they're all fools. I'll keep telling nobody listens to me. We could get Japan to surrender now. You understand? But nobody will listen. And Forrest also said, what's, what's it now? It's all about keeping the emperor. When you say the words unconditional surrender, it means that they'll have to dismantle everything. Just tell them you don't want to dismantle everything. You just control the country. They can keep the stupid emperor if they want it, because he's the one in charge. And he's obviously not, not going to agree to anything in which he's not part of it. You see? And Forrest always says he's so uh, desperate to think of, uh, you know, some way to keep Russia out. So he says, so it won't be unconditional. Big deal. That way, Japan will surrender before Russia even gets in the war. And Russia won't get all these territorial gains. But we have to hurry. We can do it now. Because things are unraveling, and pretty soon the Russians will get in. And then what's going to be? Um, others in the administration... Um, we're adamant that, uh, you know, no Emperor Hirohito, he's got to go. There was Hitler, it was Mussolini, it was Hirohito. The three guys, you understand? And, and this was a criminal, and this was a criminal, and this is a criminal. And just like Roosevelt said, we gotta, there's no uh, escaping justice for those who perpetrated uh, X, Y, and Z. And to be perfectly honest, he, he was a criminal. So uh, they said, in the same way they were anti-Nazi, they were anti-Hirohito, they said uh, he has to be punished unconditional surrender at any price. Um, this was very common administration. Of course, it's easy for you to say, then you've the, the, got to send the Marines and the soldiers to die for it. So here you have it. Now, of the people who felt this way, some were like Truman, who were, uh, uh, you know, for understandable reasons. Uh, Truman was an anti-Nazi. That's one of the things he was. And to many Americans, uh, the Japanese were equal to the Nazis. And so he felt if he... Uh, it moderates his position on Hirohito and on surrender, it's like moderating your position on Hitler. And his conscience as an American, and as an, as I say, an anti-fascist, and so, you know, wouldn't let him do that. Um, others were cynical. Uh, Harry White <laughs> stood for Stalin's reasons, don't let Hirohito go, kill him, all that, because he wants Japan to stay in the war so Russia can get it. You understand? So it got very complex in the highest levels of the American administration. Uh, Zacharias says to Forrestal, he says, I guess, let me do something we haven't done already in, in, in the war so far. What's that? He said, remember there was a Tokyo Rose? Uh, how come there was no American, uh, what, what, what we call it, Washington Sally? <laughs> he said, how come nobody tries to broadcast to the Japanese tell them to surrender? They didn't think that way. The Americans also, I guess, Japanese are all uh, robots. They follow uh, whatever the emperor says, they kill themselves in battle, there's no use talking, Brett to the vent, all the rest of it. And Zakari said, like you're a bunch of racist fools, <laughs> you understand? It's not true. Japanese are people like you and I, they have their culture, no question about it, but there's ways of dealing with it. You understand? There's ways, of, if you know how to talk to them, you don't know Japanese. When the war started, uh, how many white people in this country, I'm going to tell you, this, knew Japanese? And the answer is 93. Right? <laughs> So in 93, there were Japanese Americans, the Nisei and so forth, which, by the way, the older, it's like, it's, it's like my kids in Yiddish. 
The older ones knew Japanese. The younger Nisei over here didn't know Japanese anymore. You understand? Know you know, they knew a few words, like, 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 like kids know about Yiddish today. But there was a 93. Now, of course, the army immediately put in a high-powered program to learn Japanese. So this guy, Zakari, was one of the very few who actually knew the Japanese. He says, we don't know nothing about these people. I do. I lived with them. I know them. You understand? And there are arguments that you can make over there. And let me tell, let me make a broadcast to them. He ended up making eight. And which will say this, surrender now, you keep the emperor. Everything will be, also be unconditional. That part you can keep. If you do it, they'll surrender. They'll agree to make peace. You understand? And um, what do you call it? And, and there he is, uh, uh, Forrestal said okay. Uh, and he broadcasted him. He said like this, listen, it'll be under the rishus of General MacArthur, but they can keep the emperor. That's what happened anyway in the end. You understand? There's MacArthur. You can even tell how they're standing over there. You can keep the emperor. MacArthur will be in charge. It's not going to hurt it. It's not going to hurt you. Uh, so do it. Uh, the Japs were very interested. The problem is, there was a private broadcast, and, and uh, Zacharias wrote a book right after the war. He has uh, the whole list of all the broadcasts. He said, I'm talking now to Admiral so and so. Do you still play poker and do this? I'm talking to Prime Minister such and such. Do you still like the yellow roses in your garden? You know what I mean? Usually, to, to, to show he knows them all personally. You follow? And he was an American naval officer. He said, don't you feel stupid for getting in this war? And, uh, you know, you, you got over your heads and, and, and all this kind of stuff. And, uh, you know, the Americans are coming after you. But the Americans don't want to destroy you. They want to put an end to your ability to destroy others. So, you hear what I said? I want to kill you. I just want to stop you from killing the others. Okay? And so, you know, we're prepared to respect your culture. And the bottom line is, keep the stupid emperor, and, uh, but, but give up the war. Now, he was broadcasting as a private individual, so to speak, meaning he wasn't officially United States government, but he was a naval officer and was, uh, it was sponsored by the Navy. So the Japanese government at that time didn't know what's going on. Is this real? Is it not real? Zakaria-san, as they call him. You know, is, they, they give out feelers. Is, is this an official position? It's not an official position. You know? And the, uh, the elites, of course, were, were, were quite interested. Um, Forrest was very excited. He said, maybe we can do this before the Russians get in. But all of a sudden, others started the protest. The liberals, for perfectly understandable reasons, as I said before, because to them, just like, just like giving Hitler a second break. That's how they saw it. This is the middle of uh, April or so of, of, of 1945. And so, uh, uh, what do you call it? Truman and Forrest all backed off. They don't want to be seen as soft on the Nazis. They couldn't do it. So they said, uh, this guy spoke for himself. He didn't speak for anybody else. It doesn't count. So the Japanese government was really confused. Uh, Zacharias was dismissed to his uh, great distress, and the war continued. And instead, preparations started to be made for the invasion of Japan. General MacArthur was uh, conquering the Philippines at that point. They said, I guess when you finish with that, they're going to be in charge of a million men. It'll be like another D-Day. You land in uh, September of uh, 45, maybe October, probably September, and uh, get ready for fun, you know? And uh, uh, the only modifying factor in all this, they think, is the atomic bomb. Because it's, it's, it was around this time that the atomic bomb was, was, was perfected and was about to be tested. So here, the, 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 he, he, here we go. Um, the U.S. started to think of, as, as Barry Stein said the other day, Einstein said in that famous letter in 1940, the, the government didn't really get involved in thinking about making an A-bomb until after Pearl Harbor. Uh, they didn't get really serious about it until he appointed one guy in charge, General Groves, in like the June, July, August of 42. Till then it was a joke. And Groves didn't get his act together until he found Oppenheimer a few months later. See, so I'm saying time went by. And then Oppenheimer and Groves, it took them the better part of a year to get their act together, to bring the scientists in and, the, you know, the, uh, uh, what do you call it, the Los Alamos and all the sorts of things. It was a gigantic... Uh, uh, operation, as you can imagine, and had to be hidden. So the U.S. didn't really get uh, into the A-bomb till late 43. So that's the timeline. You know, then that's when things really, all the scientists came together and the experiments started to happen and the gigantic factories were you know, turning out whatever the science needs for them to turn out. And so it was a business of, you know, uh, 15 months, 18 months, whatever, whatever, whatever comes out, to, less than two years. Um, this whole thing. It's just interesting, the timeline. And you know, it's, I always like to say it's a different America because how are you going to come up? It costs two billion. Two billion at that time was like, I don't know what today. I won't say two trillion, but maybe. You know, it was a crazy number. 
and uh, and how are you going to do it? And you have to hide it because otherwise the Germans, the Japanese, are saying, well, "What's this extra two billion going for nothing?" You know, what, what's going over there? So what they used to do is they buried in the in the budgets. You understand? But how you do that? Because uh, nobody's supposed to know. So uh, General Marshall, who had a reputation for integrity, Rock of Gibraltar, you know, Marshall. See, he went. It's a different America. He went to Sam Rayburn, who was the Speaker of the House, who also was like that. He said like this. I need two billion, nobody should know about it, and you put it in my pocket, don't ask any questions. That's what he said. You see, you wanna, you, I'm going to make an account, you put two billion in. And he said, I'll, and I'm telling you, you can't ask what it's for. And baby said, I trust you. And he called in like 10 heads of um, committees in the Congress, because that time the speaker was very powerful, and he had a reputation for integrity. It's like this, everybody shut up and put 100 million stick it somewhere in your budget and, and give it to me. Don't ask where it's going. You can't ask where it's going. And they say, yes, sir. So that's how it happened and nobody knew. You know, the, try, try that today. <laughs> try that in Baltimore City. Yeah, 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 yeah. Anyway, uh, the, anyway the, the point's like this. You get a phone call from Rio, you know. Anyhow, um, so... The Americans, by the time I'm talking about middle of 45, finally worked out the A-bomb with all the different ups and downs. And they said, we got one that's ready to go, we think. And so here you poor Truman. A little while ago, you <laughs> ran a haberdashery shop. Then a few years later, Senator. And now you got to figure out Stalin, Japan, atomic bomb. <laughs> Should we go in with this? Should we try that? And uh, he had to go see uh, Stalin one minute. Excuse me. Since the war was over in, in Europe, so he went to the Potsdam Conference. Those he went to see, meet with Stalin and Churchill uh, over there. And while he's on the ship going over to Europe, uh, that's when um, the A bomb went off. You understand? So at the time, there's a Truman, obviously, and, and, and Stalin and Churchill meeting in Potsdam to discuss what to do with uh, the world. Stalin, by the way, they promised, I'll go in, in, in 90 days, I'll go attack um, Japan. Because I got to transport an army over there. Russia didn't have a big, they had one railroad going to Siberia. So, you know, it, it takes time. Um, during the conference, it's very famous, uh, that's when the A-bomb blew up. No, that's when they had the successful, famous uh, Oppenheimer, you know, thing in Almogordo, right? I think you all know what I'm talking about. And uh, the, the, this actually original uh, um, thing over there. So Truman said, I guess, this is Gavaldic. Uh, now, but we won't have to lose all, all those men. You understand? Uh, we'll threaten Japan, and if they're stupid enough to keep it up, then we'll blow them up. That's all. Uh, now, as you'll see, he's wrong. Truman said, now the Japanese will, will certainly surrender. But he was wrong. Um, the three powers, uh, Truman, Stalin, Churchill, issued what they call the Potsdam Declaration to Japan. And here it is. If you look very closely, I won't read everything. But he says like this, we want a complete surrender and the result of futile and senseless German resistance to might arouse free worlds in awful clarities of example Japan. Meaning, think of how Germany just got bombed to bits. Uh, if Japan wants to escape this, give up now. now. Let's go to the next page. Time has come to decide whether Japan wants to be controlled by self-willed militaristic advisors whose unintelligent calculations have brought the Empire of Japan to threshold of annihilation or whether she'll follow reason. And here are terms, we won't deviate from them. We must eliminate all those, the militarists, and until then, we're going to occupy Japan with an army. Uh, the terms are kind of, you'll have to give away all the land you stole from China. Uh, the Japanese army will be disarmed, not killed, disarmed. Let's go to the next one. We do not intend that the Japanese shouldn't be enslaved as a race. We do not intend that Japanese would be destroyed as a nation, but stern justice for the war criminals. The government, will remove all ob uh, the government of Japan will remove all obstacles to democracy. And there'll be good freedom of, we want freedom of speech and religion and thought for the Japanese people, and so on and so forth. And we want them to build up their industry and be peaceful after the war. So in other words, they said like this, surrender, we want total surrender, but we're not going to kill you, you know. We're not like you, okay. And so uh, they figured, this is very fair, uh, maybe the Japanese will back off. But of course it didn't happen, okay. And the reason is, 
as Zacharias could have said like this. You didn't put in there what they're looking for. They don't look for all the other words. What are they looking for over there? You can keep the emperor. Because <laughs> who's in charge? The emperor. Right? The main clause I want is David Cass gets the money. <laughs> you follow? They went, that, that, that's the thing. So the Japanese said, and yet. So Truman was like totally frustrated. He didn't Go. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay. Okay? Yeah. So as you can see, this Potsdam Declaration was actually very fair. The only thing is, I mean, very fair to the Japanese, but there's no mention about the emperor. And the Japanese, uh, to everyone's surprise, said, yet, uh, we're not giving in. So Truman was unbelievably frustrated, because here you are, middle of 45, and they're not giving up. And you can see, he issues a warning, he says, like, tremendously frustrated, you better, you better, you better, take a look at this. There can be no peace in the world until the military power of Japan is destroyed. With the same completeness as was the power of the European dictators. To do that, we are now engaged in the process of deploying millions of our armed forces against Japan in a mass movement of troops and supplies and weapons over 14,000 miles a military and naval feat unequaled in all history. Substantial portions of Japan's key industrial centers have been leveled to the ground in a series of record incendiary raids. What has already happened to Tokyo will happen to every Japanese city whose industries feed the Japanese war machine. If the Japanese insist on continuing resistance, beyond the point of reason, their country will suffer the same destruction as Germany. Our blows will destroy their whole modern industrial plant and organization, which they have built up during the past century, and which they are now devoting to a hopeless cause. We have no desire or intention to destroy or enslave the Japanese people, but only surrender can prevent the kind of ruin which they have seen come to Germany as a result of continued useless resistance. Musicians, isn't that true? You know, around the world. So he, in other words, Thomas, he took a uh, position, a regular, normal teaching position in music. He was a chashuv guy, apparently, in the teaching of music. So his uh, kids are uh, growing up in Japan, uh, including his daughter Betty. In nineteen, she's Jewish. I told you though, the Jews in Japan didn't suffer. In nineteen thirty-nine, uh, she's college age. And so she goes to San Francisco to, 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 to study American college from which she graduated, Mills College. So she's an American college when Pearl Harbor hits. Uh, so she can't go back to Japan, even though her family's there. But it's a war. And not only that, but when Pearl Harbor hit, the U.S. government found out to its consternation how many people in the country other than Japanese can speak and understand and read and write Japanese. Out of the 140 million Americans, the answer is 93. So she's one of the 93. Agreed? She grew up in Japan. So she is in big demand by the U.S. government, you know, by the, by the intelligence people, by this group. Blah, blah. So right off the bat, when December 7th, 1941, after that, until the end of the war, she fully occupied working for the American government, you know, translating and all this stuff with, 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 with Japanese. Then the war's over. When the war's over, she said, I guess I want to go see my parents. They said, nobody's going over there unless you join the staff of MacArthur because they're going to run the country. I'm joining the staff of MacArthur. I have the qualifications. So he takes us. She's Jewish. She's female. And she's the only one. And she goes over, as you can see in the next picture, returning to Japan after the surrender. Where's my mommy and daddy? Okay? 
Um, and so here she is on, on MacArthur's staff among all these soldiers. And basically, uh, she's one of the few that can read and write Japanese, as I said before. And when MacArthur says, I guess, what do we do at the militarism? He, she says, I guess, tell them to make a rule to give the woman the vote. Well, MacArthur goes through the idea and he calls the Japanese and he said, write a new constitution and give the women the vote. Now, in Japan, you don't say no, especially MacArthur, so they stall. And they stall and they stall and they stall. And it was clear that they weren't going to do it. They said, you know, uh, this red tape and this thing, another committee and all the rest. And finally, MacArthur, loses, in 46, loses his patience and he calls in his own staff. He went to the, his own uh, American staff. He's like, yes, you guys write the constitution and, and then I'll make them accept it. You understand? Because if I wait for them to write, it's not going to happen. And I'll make sure the Japanese vote for it. And now, what about the women's uh, vote? You, young lady, you write the Civil Rights Clause to give the women the equality of vote. And she does. <laughs> so she wrote Article 24 of the Japanese Constitution. It was shoved down the throats. This is what she wrote. Marriage shall be based only on the mutual consent of both sexes and maintained through mutual cooperation with equal rights of husband and wife as a basis. This in the Constitution. With regards to choice of spouse, property rights, inheritance, choice of domicile, divorce, and other matters pertaining to marriage and the family, laws will be enacted from the standpoint of individual dignity, again, individual dignity, and the essential equality of the sexes. Now, I would write it a little bit better, but nevertheless, she's 22 years old. Uh, she just had a BA, and uh, she put it in there, and once she wrote it up, but Carson basically said like this, so he saw the Japanese, you were going to vote this in, and they do. There was a plebiscite, and Japanese people voted for it, and that's their constitution, Adeyamaze. So she, Betty Sroda, became a hero for all the Japanese women. Adeyamaze, there she is. She, they, you know, wherever she went, she died not long ago. Her name was Betty Sroda Gordon. She married a guy, Gordon, Jewish guy. And uh, my goodness, you know, there's a million books and dissertations and things like this in Japan. We don't know about it in America, but in Japan they know. There's a Jewish lady on MacArthur's staff who gave the women the freedom. Because until then, they had no freedom. And so, I'm concluding by saying that these two Jews, to end our story, Wolf Lajinsky, Ladajinsky, and Betty Sirota, helped play, they played a major role in turning the MacArthur occupation into a remarkable episode in history. I'll tell you right now, uh, there is no other case of this. The United States occupied Japan militarily from 45 to 51, uh, when they signed the peace treaty. So MacArthur was the ruler um, he did so much for them that to this day they venerate him and whenever a Japanese emperor or, or a prime minister come to America one of the places they go is to put flowers on the grave of MacArthur now that's unique because usually you don't like the person that was your occupier but they realized that the Americans under MacArthur you can't take away from him he said Americans under MacArthur they not only didn't hurt Japan because he was very careful, if you heard his statement on the battleship Missouri, he said, I'm going to be just and tolerant, provided the Japanese carry out everything that I say. They have to fulfill 100% the surrender terms, but we're not going to go and, as, uh, and be sadists. We're not going to treat you like you would have treated us. We're not going to rape Nanking. As a matter of fact, when he got off that airplane that I showed you before, this is famous, MacArthur issued two immediate orders. Order number one, any American soldier who touches a Japanese girl will be shot. Order number two, any American who touches Japanese food will be shot because they're starving and they can't afford to give anything up. You see? When the Japanese heard this, they said, this is not what we would have made. He's a pretty good guy. So how did he do this? He did this through the intelligent use of staff with ideas, including, for my purposes, um, these two important Jewish members, all of which means that MacArthur is what you would call, in my opinion, a intelligent anti-Semite. Uh, Here's what George Bernard Shaw famously said, that an anti-Semite is a person who dislikes Jews more than necessary. Uh, MacArthur did not fall into that uh, category. On the other hand, uh, to end on a less uh, happy note, uh, we have the tragedy of uh, Captain Al Zacharias. Uh, because as I said before, he died in the 60s. And he said like this, he says, if they would listen to me, he says, I was over there, I knew the Japanese, I was my in the suga, as they say, if they would listen to me way back when, in the beginning of 1945, so many Marines got killed, and Army, and the Okinawa, and the Iwo Jima, and uh, the Kamikaze planes, which blew up whole American ships and, and killed everybody aboard, plus the Japanese losses, plus Stalin taking over all the, you know, he, he, he couldn't help live, what if, what if, okay? And uh, therefore, I conclude 
by saying that you see throughout this entire series a very important point, and that is we are all victims of our own cultures. We can't help it. Um, we work within cultural context. There are things that we can do, things that we can't do, which are excuse me, which are governed by our cultural blinders. And uh, World War II, and as far as the United States and Japan was an example of this, and uh, this should be food for thought. Good night.